13. And if you like to be seated, that's great. If you want to stand, that's awesome as well. Come, all who are weary, here we wait for the Lord. Come, all who look for hope, here we embrace God's steadfast love. The Lord be with you. Let us greet one another in Christian fellowship.
Together, God of comfort and healing, we come today with many questions. How will we survive the challenges of this day? Can we get through our moments of loss and grief? We'll be comforted when our tears flow like mighty streams. In the midst of our questions, we hear your voice of assurance and comfort. May we remember your abiding presence and your steadfast love. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This is a time in our service when we share our joys and our concerns with each other and with God. If you have, how we do it here is you raise your hand and the usher will come forward with a microphone for you so you can be heard. My only request is if you're sharing somebody else's news, make sure you have their permission to do so. Do we have any joys or concerns this morning? Hi, um, my granddaughter got hurt this past weekend and she's supposed to get out of the hospital tomorrow, so just pray that the infection goes down and she can come home. All right, thank you. That's fine. Yes. I have three prayer requests this morning. Number one is I went to pick up Shirley this morning and they came and told me the ambulance was coming after her. She had fallen. Aww. And lo and behold, I'm sitting here and she walks in. <laughs> and the other two are uh, prayers for my nephew Bill and his wife Linda, who had three children that unfortunately were addicted to drugs. Three years ago, they left, lost their son. Last year, they lost a daughter. And two days ago, they lost the third daughter. Oh. So it's very, very hard. Um, the third request is, um, my daughter-in-law's mother last night passed away very unexpectedly. She was in a nursing home in Syracuse, but she had been fine, and they went in and just found her, her passed away. So prayers for them. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have a joy. The original painting of Asbury Church has now been framed, and it is hanging in the main entrance area of the church. If you get a chance, please go back and look at it. And uh, if you have any comments about it, I'll uh, appreciate that. But I think it looks very, very good, and uh, it should be in the church for a long time. Thank you. Do you know there's a stuffy name for that entryway space? It's called a narthex. <laughs> now you will live another day. <laughs> Anyone else this morning? I want to give you an update on my mom. She is still in the hospital. She was supposed to be discharged Thursday, but she was dehydrated for lack of fluids, and she's not eating uh, enough to feed a bird. So they put her on IVs yesterday for half a day to get her fluids back up so her blood pressure would go back up to normal 
we're hoping Monday will be a better day and she can be discharged to rehab, but um, it, it really is her, in her control how she moves forward. And so we're praying that she chooses to, you know, f fight the recovery, to, I mean, to fight for her life. And uh, she's almost 94, so prayers for my mom. Let's pray together. Lord, we hear of infections, illnesses, falls, death from overdoses, death from aging, the challenges of recovering from major surgery. And any one of these things throw us for loops. But you are the great balancer. You help us to find our center of gravity in you. Remind us that not only for ourselves, but for all those for whom we pray this morning, that ours and their lives are in your capable hands. They always have been. They always will be. As Jesus said, for eternity, we are given everlasting life. So, Lord, we lift to you these prayers mentioned today, as well as the prayers upon our heart. And as your Son, our Savior, taught his disciples these words, we together say these, this beloved prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the children like to come forward for their time? I want to tell you the story of when my grandson Josh was around two years old, a little older maybe, but he was definitely using words to communicate. And his mom was telling him there was something he needed to do. Maybe it was to get dressed, Maybe it was to eat, sit at the table politely and eat his meal. Maybe it was picking up toys. Maybe it was about going to bed. I don't remember exactly what it was that she was trying to get him to do. And, but I was there and I watched. And I wondered what would happen. And finally, Josh looked at his mother very seriously and said, you're not the boss of me. He's now 19, <laughs> and he's still living, so he survived that. <laughs> You're not the boss of me, which means he was saying, I'm the boss of me, right? And even though I am sure that there are grown-ups in your life that tell you things that you are supposed to do, both at home and at school, still, still, and maybe at daycare and other places, there still is a part of us that we're the boss of. We make decisions. And the older we get, the more decisions we make. 
Well, one of the decisions we make is how we're going to greet the day. Now, there are things that can impact it, like if you stay up too late on a Friday night or a Saturday night, and maybe you're too tired, or maybe if you're not feeling well, that can impact your day because you're not feeling well, or if something's injured, that can impact your day. But except for those things, if it's a normal day, you get to be the boss to decide how you're going to face the day. Now, you can face it as a grumpy grump. And no one will say thank you for that. You can also face it with joy, remembering that you are deeply, deeply, deeply loved. Loved by your family and loved by God. And because you are deeply loved, you can embrace the day with joy. And joy is this interesting thing. It's contagious, like a cold is contagious. One person can give a cold to another person. Well, joy is contagious. You can give joy to another person. And Jesus wanted us to know joy completely, which means with every part of who we are, with our fingers, with our mind, with our hearts, with our toys, toes, with our knees. Jesus wanted us to completely know what joy was. And it begins by remembering that we are deeply loved. Let's pray together. For, for eyes that see and minds that think, thank you, God, for loving me. Amen. You may go back to wherever you're supposed to go. Oh, I guess it's right there. That's where you're supposed to go. So there are updated 2023 words to Jesus loves the little children, as there should be. <laughs> So they, the new words are every color, every race, all are covered by his grace. So. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Habakkuk. It is chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. You will find that on page 813 in the Pew Bible. Though the fig trees do not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy 
in the God of my salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our congregational song is He is Exalted. Please stand. Please pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our salvation. Amen. There is a song that I am guessing many of us here know. It is not in the blue hymnal. It is not in the black faith we sing. It is not in the orange song book. It's not there. It is not the national anthem, but some people cling to it like it is a national anthem. And I'm going to start singing, and I want you to sing with me. Sing it out. Sing it with confidence. It goes like this. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Come on, you know this one. I'll start again. You know this. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. Come on, you know this song. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. What were you doing when Hee Haw was on TV? (sighs) I had no idea Asbury was so uppity. But it is a song, and, it, and, it, and these four men would sing it, and between each line, somebody would go, oh. And then they would tell some story of lament. It's almost as well-loved as the one that was, where, oh, where are you tonight? Now, when I talk about that kind of lamenting. I want to begin by saying that I am not talking about mental illness. I'm not talking about depression that is like a sadness 
that feels as if bricks are being piled upon your chest. I know what that's like. And I'm not talking about anxiety when you are so filled with panic that you don't even know if you can breathe. I know what that's like. Those are afflictions that come from mental health issues, and I'm afflicted with those things. I've had it diagnosed, I've been to therapy, I take medication, I know what that's like. So I'm not talking about mental health concerns. What I'm talking about is attitude. And attitude is something over which we do have control. And like my grandson Josh, who around two shouted, you're not the boss of me, you're the bosses of you and I'm the boss of me. And whether we lament or rejoice are decisions that we make. And we make them regularly. And they become habit forming. I remember when Steve and I were first married and Jennifer, our youngest, was a junior in high school and so she had to move between her sophomore and junior year, which is very, very difficult, and I know that also. And so we kind of bribed her by letting her decorate her bedroom. And also, she was in a new household because her dad and I had been married for only six months. So that was a new experience too. And her sisters were not in the home because they were, uh, the next sister up was living with their mother and the oldest one was now married. I remember when she picked her room, she wanted one wall to be painted a fire engine red. The next wall she wanted black and white stripes. The third wall she wanted red and black stripes. And the fourth wall she wanted white with black polka dots. And we did it. I apologized to the pastor who followed us saying, I have no idea how you're gonna get that red off that wall. That property was later purchased by a developer who turned it into apartments. So they never had to get that paint off that wall. And she collected pandas, so the black and white and red motif, it, it was adorable. But yet, in spite of our best effort to make her living environment, her bedroom, the way she wanted it, in spite, of, in spite of our best attempts to surround her with love and encouragement, in spite of our sensitivity to the pain of adjustments, she was miserable. And so I was sensitive to her miserableness for as long as I could. Hint, my saturation point is six months. <laughs> Till finally I just said to her, Jennifer, you're unhappy. Yes, I am. I said, because you want to be. And when you decide you don't want to be unhappy, when you realize it's not going to work for you, there's no benefit in that, then you will be happy again. But it's on you. I absolve myself of responsibility for your happiness. And it happened. She was able to get involved with a church youth group. She made friends at school. She went on and embraced her life, and she was better. But it took me a while as a step-parent to realize that it was a choice she was making. And being discouraged 
and cynical and jaded and blue. Apart from mental illness, I'm talking about attitude. Those are choices that we make. And they are habit forming. This passage, and, and it's not based on empirical evidence. There will people who will say, I'm unhappy because, and they will list things. They're unhappy because they couldn't get a red car, they could only get a blue car, and so they're unhappy. They're unhappy because the world, they're stressed at work. They're unhappy because the meal that came to them in the restaurant was not prepared to their liking. And I bet many of you have experienced being at a restaurant where someone who made it very clear they were unhappy with their food and ruined the dinner for everybody else who was sitting at the table. I bet you know someone like this who has made a habit out of lamenting. I have to be honest, because of my saturation point with that kind of negativity, that I put boundaries on how much time I spend in that company. It's not that I don't love, it's not that I don't care, it's not that I don't want the best for, but it kind of takes the oxygen out of the room and I find myself wilting like a plant that doesn't have water. Well, guess what? Joy is also a decision. It's something that we have the capacity. And like the scripture that was read and the entire verses of it is on the cover of your bulletin. So if you don't remember what Mark said, just look on your bulletin cover. It lists all this empirical evidence about which we could be depressed. The fig trees are not growing figs. The olives are not growing, olive branches are not growing olives. The sheep have taken off to New Jersey. <laughs> which makes you wonder about the intelligence of sheep. And you go to your stalls and you realize you have no livestock there. In spite of all of this evidence, still the prophet will celebrate the joy of the Lord, the God of his salvation. In spite of all the data points that give us the excuse to lament, he says, I choose joy. And this prophet is a model for us. Because, like I said to the children, we need to remember that we are deeply, deeply, deeply loved. That the God who created us, who breathed into us the breath of life, loves us unconditionally loves us when we do well, loves us when we make mistakes, just loves us. And knowing we are loved and cherished and that that relationship will not end no matter what. Not even death can end that relationship is a reason to communicate joy. And for those of us who claim to be Christian, we add to that the confession that we are saved by the act of Jesus. 
our salvation is secure. The world can do what it wants to us. It can break our elbow. It can knock us down. Our bodies can fail from time to time. And we can have taken from us those who we cherish the most. Even still, we can communicate joy because we haven't been abandoned by God. That's why I titled this message, Hallelujah Anyway. We are Hallelujah people. We are people who can see the good in the midst of gray. And we are so needed in our culture today. We are needed. We are as essential as water to the parched earth. We are needed. Be a person of joy. And if you are with someone who has gotten into the negativity habit with love, rattle them until their teeth shake and remind them how loved they are by our Lord. Amen. Now I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord but you don't really care for music do ya? It goes like this the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the bass Oh
We offer to you, O oh God, a portion of our wealth, a larger portion of our hands, a full portion of our hearts. Please receive these gifts and bless them. Put all to good use for the work of your kingdom. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 261 in the blue hymnal, The Lord of the Dance. They ripped and 
thought your rule was four verses. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Ready? They caught me down and I left them high. I heard the life that will never, never die. I'll live in you. Christ who redeems our life in the name of the Holy Spirit that sustains us in life. Go forth from this place, renewed and at peace. Amen. 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 Thank you. There's no more music. You're all set. Go to coffee hour. We'll see you there. See you at coffee hour. <laughs>